Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making an impact, empowering the good in our community and around the globe. And today we're honored to have Eric Harris, an exemplary educator and the driving force behind JessRan, a nonprofit on a mission to diminish the persistent effects of poverty. Through a multifaceted approach that emphasizes academic, economic, cognitive, and social support, JessRan stands as a beacon of hope for many. Led by Eric's flagship program, Equity to Prosperity, the organization is pioneering an early start to formal education, ensuring that every child has the tools to prosper. We're gonna dive deep into the heart and soul of Jess Rain and understand the vision and strategies employed by Eric to bring about meaningful change. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course, start by telling us the story behind the name Jess Rand. Oh, wow. Um, Jess Rand was born uh, from this crazy idea that I had. Um, I was in education for a long time and I've always was searching for the answer. It, it always seemed like the same group of kids, no matter what school, no matter what area, were always the same kids that didn't perform. It seemed like the schools always had the same amount of cards that they had to play. Uh, the parents had about the same amount of knowledge. So doing a lot of soul searching throughout my career and also a lot of research at the University of Memphis, I was able to come up with this concept uh, that we do at Jess Ran. And since, because of the educational focus, because of the uh, economic focus, it really took me back to my upbringing with my parents. Um, two parents who worked hard, they grew up during the Depression as sharecroppers out in Fayette County, Tennessee. Uh, neither had the opportunity to finish uh, high school, which they both deeply regretted their entire lives. My mom had to drop out in the eighth grade to work in the fields and my father the 10th grade. Uh, so education was very important to them. So as a testament to them, my mother, Jesse, and my father, Randolph, is the name Jess Rand. Well, what a beautiful uh, legacy to continue of your parents to really honor them as part of your foundation to be able to make a difference in our community and I love the work around education. Obviously, that's a huge part of your legacy and what you were doing. The idea of beginning formal education at two years age, uh, two years of age, is both intriguing and unique. I have three children under three, so I definitely understand <laughs> how you important it. it is. Yes, to educate them at definitely. a young age, and really how that how that sets them apart from their peers. Uh, to be able to succeed in at school. So why do you believe this early start is pivotal in the fight against poverty? Well, I won't get into a lot of the boring research terms uh, from it, but just using your kids, for example, I'm sure when they got around to, you heard about the terrible twos, right? They were <laughs> getting into everything and you'd stop, you know, hey, that stove is hot, don't touch it. They still want to touch it because they don't know what hot is, right? So it's at age two when their brain literally wakes up. Um, think of it as a little computer that's just looking for information and they want input, 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 input all day long. And the more information that you input into their brain, the more that it processes and the more capability that it has to process. Um, so if you take this child at age two and you literally feed them with as much information as you can, their brains actually develop. Um, they're able to transcend all these bad trend lines that a lot of ch uh, children, especially those in poverty, uh, experience. I mean, here in Shelby County, we have over a quarter of our children under age five who grew up in poverty. Um, and it's also unfortunate that brain science shows you that their brains don't really develop the way that they should. Not saying that they're not intelligent or they aren't smart. They are. Uh, but in terms of being able to to use higher order thinking and, and reasoning and self-regulation and all these other things, they're really limited to do it. Um, so two is the absolute perfect age to start them. And another part of this, and I'm sorry, I know this answer may be a little long-winded, but another part of that is society as a whole, we failed in that we put that pressure on our parents. If you have a two-year-old in 2023, you're probably a young parent, um, meaning 25, 30 years old, maybe. Um, and there's a lot of things in life that you haven't experienced yourself, but yet here you are now responsible for this little person and teaching them all these things that they need to know and also helping their 
development uh, to become this great academic student. Parents don't have that, you know, and we need to quit putting pressure on them as if they do. As educators, we have all the ability, we have the skill, we have the research, we have everything that we need. So let's take on that responsibility and work with those parents to make sure our kids are straight, as they would say. I love that. And I can attest that the struggle is real. And I do sit in a um, a space of privilege where we are able to send them to Mother's Day out two days a week exactly. and our wife is able to stay home. And we say it constantly that while we sit at this at this uh, seat of privilege, we still struggle. And so for us, I cannot imagine the quarter of Shelby County and kids that are their parents are there. They have to go to work and many of them may come from a single parent household and they're working, you know, they're, they're struggling. Talk about the financial assistance just rain provides uh, with that. Definitely. And actually you just hit spot on with a big part of our program uh, that I was going to bring up when you talked about kids and being able to spend time with your children, sending them to mother's day out a couple of days a week. Uh, and also how a lot of parents, especially those who are impoverished or don't quite make what they need to to support their families, they have to work more. They work odd hours. There's a lot of research that shows that children mainly learn through their relationships, their relationships with the people around them, their relationships and engagement with the things around them. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference when you are talking to your child. If you're in the kitchen and you're making things and you're describing what you're doing, hey, you know, I'm going to take out this pan. I'm going to make an egg. I need milk. You'd be amazed at how much kids pick up on that. But if the parent is at work and not around, the child really doesn't have that, that basis to learn as they would. So it, with E2P or equity prosperity, which is what it's called, our program is centered on that. We have a, right now we have a class of 25 students. Uh, there are five adults who work with these students. They all co-teach. They work together. Uh, it's part Montessori, it's part STEM, it's part uh, engagement, but it's a beautiful, beautiful thing in how it is because we literally do everything that encourages the development of the child. These two-year-olds are able to choose sort of like Montessori what it is that they want to do, but every single activity in the room is a learning experience for them. Uh, they aren't just playing. This aren't just daycare. We aren't watching them. We make sure that wherever they are, some sort of engaging learning activity. Um, so they go through these different areas throughout the day, uh, mixing in recess and lunch and all these other things. And it works great uh, for the parent. We support them not only with the things that we talked about, uh, but Martin Luther King was right before he was assassinated. Uh, he really began to speak on a concept called guaranteed income. And it's something that a lot of people have not heard of because it was so new. Uh, and I, I really wish he was around longer to really preach this message that he understood. But basically, if you are a parent and you are impoverished, you probably receive child care. You can receive a child care voucher. You will probably receive a food voucher. You can get a housing voucher. You can also get Medicaid. That's great. Absolutely necessary. You need it. But what happens if you need a new tire for your car or if your radiator breaks out or if your school is a part of if your child is a part of a school system that needs uniforms, where does all that come from? You know, you don't have the money to pay for it. Um, also, all of those things are income based. So what happens if all of a sudden you're making the income you need to make to get the benefit? But because you've been working hard, you get a raise. And that raise, even though and this actually happened to one of my parents this year, she's a mother of three children. And she got a raise that took her up to right at $40,000 a year. It was 39 and some change. But because of that, she lost all her benefits. Now, as a parent, imagine being a single parent with three children, three small children, and making $39,000 a year. So now all of a sudden, you've got this huge income gap because you no longer get those benefits uh, or those things you needed and you have to fend for yourself. So what this guaranteed income payment we do for our parents is we give them a guaranteed income stipend every single month. Um, there's no restrictions to it. We don't tell them what they can and cannot spend it on. Um, it, it's a preloaded debit card on the 15th of every month. They get a guaranteed income stipend of $500. Now, we do track the spending because we're doing research to prove that we believe our parents know better what their families need than anyone can tell them. 
Um, so we are tracking that data and the parents are totally fine with it. Uh, but you'd be amazed at some of the stories. Um, we have a very young mother uh, in the program and, and she was struggling just to get her kid clothes. You know, she said she's growing so much. It's so hard for me to buy her clothes and shoes and they're able to do that. You know, there's another parent who you'd be amazed at how happy a parent can be when a child's birthday comes around and they can take them and get a cake and have a little party for them. Or, you know, this hot summer month at MLGW bill is just way high. So getting a little help with that through this program has really made a big difference for our parents. Eric, the work that you're doing, your parents, I just can imagine how proud they are of you. Thank you. Like the work that you are doing is transforming so many lives. And when we talk about poverty, there are so many misconceptions about people living in poverty. And I love that your guaranteed um, income with this program isn't limited to specifics because like you said, there's been many times where you feel like you've finally paid all the bills for the month barely. And then your tire goes out and you go, okay, well, I guess I'm gonna have to put that on a credit card or I'm going to have to, if, if for some, how someone may still have some savings, they would be able to use that. But that's very unlikely, very unlikely for those living in poverty. Talk about some of the common myths for us for people living in poverty, especially when it comes to education and how having a program helps lift generations out of poverty to thrive because of the help that they receive. Absolutely. Poverty is twofold. Poverty is right now and also poverty is in your future. Um, right now, we are taking care of our parents by giving them things like the guaranteed income, which comes with a lot of wraparound support. We don't just give them money. Uh, we have a social worker um, who we contract with, who meets with the parents every single month, and they go over all of these social emotional things that are going on in their, in their house and teaching them to cope with things. Uh, you'd be amazed at some of the stories um, that our parents are able to tell how much they've learned on how they can contribute to their child's well-being in our houses through these programs. We also do financial literacy. Uh, we have a couple of parents who just recently completed a, completed a housing program um, because they wanted to own their own house, but they're 23, 24 years old and really didn't know what that process was. So they went through, were able to work with our people and they were able to do that. So we offer a lot of those type services to help the family now. In terms of the future, by making sure that these children have exactly what they need to be successful so that we turn them into the lifelong learners they're going to be. Everyone knows education is the key when it comes to breaking poverty. And if we're able to teach these students to, to think and, and to self-regulate themselves and also be creative enough to learn um, things, creative enough whenever a situation isn't quite what they expected, then we're setting them up for complete success. Um, there's so much data out there that shows what we're doing works. Um, real simple, kindergarten success means that you will be a successful third grader. And I'm sure we've all seen the data that third grade is tied into so many success metrics uh, for high school. Um, in fact, there are prisons built in areas based on the amount of third graders who are not on track. Um, if we can get our, ch our children closing those gaps by the time they're in kindergarten, it's amazing. Um, I just give you one statistic. There's a when a kid is four years old or five, their brain is about 80 percent developed. Uh, if that kid grew up in poverty, they're probably about four year, about three or four years behind their peers who did not grow up at age four. So it's like, OK, what did they learn? What did they miss? And that gap only grows as they get older. Um, so breaking that gap, taking care of this kid's future, taking care of the family right now, that's the best way to go about poverty. Amen. Well said there. Talk about some of the improvements you've seen in the children enrolled in equity to prosperity and then some of the current partnerships as well. Oh, gosh. Um, it, <laughs> we started this in August uh, of 2022. And the kids, they came in, they were all as cute as they can be because there's no such thing as a two year old who's not cute. Right. So they came in and they had these personalities, which were amazing because you think they're all babies. No, they all are these individuals with their personalities. Um, there were some who were a little bit further along than others in terms of how they would express themselves, either physically 
uh, or verbally to students who were literally nonverbal. Uh, we had a couple of students, they did not talk at all. Um, there were concerns there. There was um, speech therapists who were involved to try to figure out if there was something seriously going on with their development. Um, but I'm excited to say that those children, every single child in our room has progressed. They have all gotten better. Um, the kids who came in nonverbal, not only are they verbal, you know, they've begun to read. Um, this year, as three-year-olds, we are literally working with them on reading. Uh, they learned all their letter sounds last year and all their letters. They didn't just learn them, their ABCs and recite them from rote memory. They literally can identify every letter and every sound. If you mix up the pack and just throw it at them, they can tell you. Uh, but now we're blending those together and they're starting to read. And it's just amazing. Uh, just seeing some earlier this week of a student actually starting to read those words. Uh, but not only that, math is something that we really stress. Um, our kids count. They don't just do a rote memory knowing their numbers one through 20. They literally can tell you how much or something. There's a lot of research to show how to do it. Uh, you take colors and you learn your colors and from colors, you learn to sort colors. And once you learn to sort, you see differences and then you learn to count how many different things you have in each category. And our kids are able to do that. So now they can really count up to however high that you need them to. Uh, and it's something that they all can do. We're very, very proud of that. Um, we're getting into a lot of the computer science. I had some, I don't know if I should say this out ready yet, but there's some experts in this field of computer science uh, and coding and specifics. And we've been working with them uh, to get this implemented into our children because there's a lot of basic code. Coding is all sequencing. It's all being able to follow a process. And our kids definitely can do that. And we've introduced them to this branch of computer science and they, they love it. It's absolutely great. So it's amazing at where this group is now as opposed to where they were. And our parents are absolutely raving. I mean, even something as simple as the meals that they get every day. And I know this is a totally different direction, uh, but I'm just thinking about how our parents is they they eat carrots for you guys. You know, they eat this vegetable and that vegetable. I can't believe it. They don't eat that for us. We're like, Mom, if you would quit pulling up to the fast food place every time they have a tantrum, they'd eat it. Um, but our kids, they love it. They get a lot of good home cooked meals there uh, for lunch and also for breakfast. And so their nutrition has changed. So you're seeing how they're growing and they have more energy and uh, it's just great. It's been absolutely great. So I, I could probably speak for six hours on the differences that I've noticed in these children in just this year. Well, once again, the work that you and your team are doing is just tremendous. And, you know, as a father, when you're talking about the work that they're able to understand and learn and eating new foods and counting and identifying colors and shapes and, and whatnot. Like this is needed not only across our County, but beyond what, what is your sort of like five year, 10 year visionary goal? And then how can people support those efforts to make it happen? Because this is this is needed across our entire country. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And actually, you're on to something with a goal. Our goal at E2P is to have, if we had this classroom in every single impoverished neighborhood here in Shelby County, it would completely transform the education. It would be a structural disruption that would set it on a completely different trajectory to where it would be the model district uh, for the schools, uh, for the state, uh, no doubt about it. So if we could spread this out here first and maybe move it out, it would be awesome. Uh, we are trying to uh, desperately expand. Uh, our data is there. We're going through a serious, serious program evaluation. Some of our uh, friends at the University of Memphis is, is conducting that evaluation. And when that comes back, we'll be able to show that what we're doing is the way to go. And hopefully uh, those who can help us, help us with your pocketbooks, help us with your bags, help us with your uh, sweat, will help us to uh, move this thing on. Um, if you go to our website, justran.org, uh, there's a lot of links there. You can see some videos about how great these kids are and what they do. You also can uh, click on something if you want to partner with us and help because the things that we're doing is not easy to do. Um, we exist kind of outside of that lane of traditional school funding. Uh, we operate as a school, we operate as a pre-K, 
but we're not, we don't receive the state funding that pre-K programs uh, and regular primary schools get. So we are in a constant look uh, for financing and I would love to have some help. If anyone would love to support or partner with us, we'll even talk more about it. Uh, please use the website to contact me if we can. And before I say anything else, I really messed up. The very first thing out of my mouth should have been a huge pat on the back. Thank you. Congratulations. We have the most awesome teachers in the world who work with this program. Um, one other trick to what we do is that we're not the typical daycare. Uh, our teachers have credentials and they have degrees. Um, they taught in the school systems. They, they have master's degrees. They have bachelor's degrees. Uh, even all the assistants have at least an associate's degree. Uh, they study early child care. We have uh, researchers and personnel and professors to give them professional development, to teach them better ways to teach a child and help them to develop. And they are literally rocking it out. Uh, and we are successful because of our teachers. Um, their collaboration is none other. I mean, they are a, a textbook encyclopedic uh, entry for uh, co-teaching. And inclusion. Having a great team of educators to really uh, spearhead this equity to prosperity program and to be able to um, to teach and educate the youth is is what it's all about. What well, puts a smile on your face when you look at the work that you've accomplished thus far? It's the kids. You know, it, it, it's every day. They, they give me the biggest smiles, you know, because it's always something different when I see them. I walk in the room, they run up, I get all these hugs and, and they just completely forget what they're doing. Now they use me to try to get out of whatever they're doing though. <laughs> you know, they want me to be the distraction, but it's okay. They are, they are just so awesome. And knowing that you're doing the right thing and they actually appreciate it and seeing them growing, it just, it does the world good. It does. I love that. Now, lastly, for budding educators or for those aiming to make a change in the nonprofit sector, you are an innovator in this space. What advice would you give them? Be persistent. Um, learn everything that you need to learn. Don't be so tunnel vision that you're not willing to accept advice. There's a lot of great organizations around the city, uh, First Aid Memphis, uh, communities and schools that know a lot, Porter Leaf. I've had the opportunity of having conversations with them all uh, when we were formed. And even people such as UT Health Science Center and the University of Memphis, you'd be amazed at how much free support that they will give you, uh, not just advice, but literally helping you to put your plan together uh, and coming out and doing training. So, um, again, be persistent in terms of your dreams, but also be willing to accept every single bit of help that you can, because it's a road, I promise you, that you can't really plan out. And you need to be ready for whatever comes about. Well said. Where can people go to learn more about Jess Ran, Equity to Prosperity, and support and follow your efforts? Well, the best place is to go to our website. Uh, it is JessRan.org, J-E-S-S-R-A-N.org. -S -S uh, lots of information there. Also, you can follow us on, on social media, excuse me, on Facebook uh, at Jess Ran Corporation, uh, and also on Instagram at Jess Ran Corporation. Great. Well, Eric, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. You are, you are literally helping create generational change. And I can't express enough as a father how you are making a difference in our community. And everyone should be supporting Just Rain Corporation, Equity to Prosperity, and your efforts. Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show and for powering the good in our community. Thank you for your overly kind words. I really appreciate that. And thank you for the opportunity.